Lecture 2.2, Property Rights, Debt, and Capital Formation. We began this unit by asserting that there is a direct connection between secure property rights and economic growth. That connection is forged by the incentives that property rights holders face to both preserve and enhance the value of their property. It works like this. How often do you check the oil, rotate the tires, or wash your own car? Now compare that to how often you perform such routine maintenance on a car you're renting. Or compare how likely you are to pick up trash you see on the sidewalk to how likely you are to pick up trash that blows into your backyard. Property right economists take as a given that people take better care of things they own. It's not surprising. If you own something of value and you let it deteriorate, you bear the opportunity cost of the lost value. Knowing that you'll bear that cost, you have an incentive to make sure that the value doesn't deteriorate. That people tend to take better care of things they own is probably a no-brainer. But what may not be so obvious and is equally important to economic growth and development is that secure property rights also create strong incentives for rights holders to improve the value of their property. The key is that ownership provides the confidence that any new value a rights holder creates from his property will also be his. You build a new deck on a house you own, and you get not only the use, but also the higher resale value. You build a new deck on a rental house, and, well, true, you get to use it, but the landlord gets the added value of the house, which is one reason you don't see too many renters making major home improvements. There's not much incentive to do so. In terms of economic growth, the ownership incentive to improve assets is a good thing because people readily understand that one way to increase the value of an asset is to make it more productive. Getting more output from the same inputs? That's definitely good. As the content standards remind us, and as we generally know from our observations and experience, the way to increase productivity is to invest in human and physical capital to make improvement. People don't have to be economists to figure this out. A poor farmer may not know that building a fence is, quote, investing in physical capital, but he sure knows that it keeps his cows from wandering and protects his piglets from predators. He may not know that taking the time to learn how to plant and care for a new type of seed provided by an aid agency is technically investing in his human capital, but he knows that his neighbor got more grain per acre with the new seed last year. So because people try to do the best for themselves that they can, we know that investment in capital development will increase as property rights are secured, even among the poor and uneducated. Sounds easy, right? Well, at some point in this explanation of the seemingly miraculous power of property rights to increase wealth-producing investments, it has probably occurred to you that just wanting to invest isn't usually enough to make it happen. Investments always bear an opportunity cost. Time for more schooling or training means time away from work. Money for new capital means less money for other things. If you're poor, those other things are likely to be food, clothing, and shelter. Even the not-so-poor usually find that they can't finance investment with their current income. For most people, investment means borrowing. We hear frequently about poor people being trapped in debt. And certainly, consuming more than you earn isn't a recipe for improving your standard of living. But there's a flip side to the coin. Debt can also be the tool that allows people to escape the prison of poverty, because it allows them to use future income to make investments now that will improve their productivity tomorrow. Most of us, rich and poor alike, could not make significant investments if we had to depend only on what we save. Debt lets us pledge our future income so that we can purchase more physical and human capital than we could afford today. And we're willing to pay interest to lenders to provide us the funds to make those purchases now rather than later. Remember, though, that lending is risky, and interest payments aren't enough to cover that risk. The bottom line is that lenders aren't willing to issue debt unless we can offer them something to reduce their risk and secure the value of the loan. 
borrowers must provide lenders with collateral. And that's where property rights are absolutely essential. The magic of title and other means of securing property rights is that they can turn property into collateral. Therefore, secure property rights provide not only the incentive, but the means for poor people to invest in the capital that will help them leave their poverty behind. Collateral commonly takes the form of assets to which the borrower has secure property rights, something the lender can capture in the event the borrower defaults. Consider how mortgages and small business loans, secured with the homes and businesses themselves as collateral, have greatly expanded home ownership and enterprise opportunities to middle and lower classes throughout the developed world. What about the very poor? It seems trite obvious that poverty isn't conducive to the accumulation of collateral. However, much recent research has found that poor people throughout the world hold surprising amounts of land and property that could serve as collateral if only they could provide lenders assurance of their property rights. Fernando de Soto has estimated that on the continent of Africa alone, there exists several billion dollars of what he calls dead capital, assets held by the poor that cannot be used as collateral because they can't provide the assurance of property rights that a lender requires. Economists tell us that in addition to facilitating capital investment, property rights have a huge immediate impact on resource use. In economic speak, they would say that Securing property rights releases resources from protective to productive activities. Simply put, this means that when property rights aren't secure, people must use resources to protect their property themselves. Although this is true for rich and poor alike, it has the greatest lifestyle impact on the poor. Unsecured property means leaving someone at home so that squatters don't take your house. It means walking long distances from field to village because it's not safe to stay near the fields at night. There are huge economies of scale and protective use of resources, building and maintaining gated communities, hiring private security, etc., that the poor can't manage. So in places where property rights are insecure, the poor bear a huge burden, giving up time and energy that they could spend on improving their lives to simply protecting what they already have. Eliminating this uncertainty can make a significant difference in a family's productivity. For example, if property rights to your dwelling are insecure and you dare not leave it unattended, the immediate impact of securing title is to release another family member to work. The long-term impact on investment in human capital is even more significant. If another adult family member can leave the house and go to work, children can quit working and go to school. Indeed, a recent study of 2,750 households in eight Peruvian cities found that when poor households were able to secure title, they averaged a 16-hour per week increase in adult labor force participation and a drop of 28% in the probability of child labor. The Peruvian study is not an isolated case. In the background outline to the lesson, you'll find a case study of property rights reforms in India computerized kiosks in rural areas that allow Indian farmers to easily obtain without having to bribe corrupt local officials copies of their RTCs, the record of rights, tenancy, and crops that is essential to formally establishing property rights to the land they may have farmed for generations. To recap then, these institutions, property rights and the rule of law, form the essential foundation for economic growth. More importantly, they create the conditions and incentives that allow the poor to become their own saviors. Throughout the developing world, lack of property rights secured by law denies the poor access to wealth generating capital and robs them of initiative and hope. From the natural right of individuals to the fruits of their own labor, to the mundane expectation that the security of homes, businesses, and possessions will be enforced, the capitalist institution of private property creates conditions conducive to economic growth, and it generates incentives that make growth likely to occur. Increasing awareness of this dynamic has resulted in successful efforts to breathe life into dead capital, 
through titling projects that are opening doors to investment for impoverished populations in Latin America and Southeast Asia, but not in Africa. Because the success of these projects depends heavily on the rule of law, the property rights door to opportunity remains firmly shut across much of that vast continent.